Yeah, welcome everybody for um, an event which happens in the framework of uh, um, Screen 17. It's the 17th iteration of screen-based exhibitions we do at Mori Art Museum. And uh, this time we are doing uh, this with works by Nancy Holt and by Robert Smithson with works they both produced individually in relation to their uh, land art practices, but also together. And I think the togetherness is a, is a very important or relation is a very important uh, issue in this talk because um, I would say Robert Smithson is very well known in Japan already. And uh, the fact that uh, we loaned two from the works from the Museum of Modern Art in Tokyo, and I want to say thank you to these colleagues, uh, is, is speaking for itself. On the other side, the work by Nancy Holt, the partner of Robert Smithson, who also managed his estate, by the way, until 2014, is not so well known yet. And so we wanted to devote this very first event in the framework of Mum's Green rather to Nancy Holt and use Robert a little bit as a as a backdrop uh, for for introducing Nancy Holt to the Japanese audience. And um, who was Nancy Holt? She was she was central. She lived from 1938 to 2014, was central to the earth, land and conceptual art movements, site specific installation and experimental moving image. She recalibrated the limits of arts, the places where art can happen, what work is, and, and embraced the new media of her time. She's asking us about the place in the world, but also the place of the world in the universe. And uh, her rich artistic output spans concrete poetry, audio works, film and video, photography, ephemeral gestures, and so much more. But I'm very happy that I have someone to uh, speak with me about Nancy Hall today. And this is actually Lisa Lefeuvre. It's a curator, writer and editor and a public speaker, and in particular, the executive director of Holt Smithson Foundation. It's an artist endowed foundation to really care for the legacies of Nancy Holt and Robert Smithson. And before doing so, uh, Lisa was head of sculpture uh, in the Hen at the Henry Moore Institute, part of the Henry Moore Foundation, and did many other jobs. Uh, she, she curated there, by the way, also a show by Jiro Takamatsu, which I found very particular in, in now that we speak to a Japanese audience. But um, the reason to talk is also that these days, I think the first comprehensive monograph of the work by Nancy Holt is uh, uh, published and it was done by Lisa herself. So I'm, I'm super thankful to have her as a partner. In, uh, in our discussion on, on, yeah, in learning more, learning for the present from Nancy. And uh, actually, I would like to start uh, with, a, with a very simple question, because Nancy Holt, she uh, grew up in New Jersey, I think, and she studied biology before she went into the arts. Um, when actually did she, she meet Robert Smithson? Because if we look at Robert Smithson's early work, one could rather think he's the one who uh, studied biology because a lot of uh, primordial uh, uh, imagery is popping up there. Mm. Thank you, Martin. And thank you also to everyone at the Mori Art Museum for us at Holt Smithson Foundation. This is a very special presentation of works by Nancy Holt and Robert Smithson. And I really appreciate the opportunity to think with you, Martin, and everyone else listening about Nancy Holt. So it's a great way to start. Nancy Holt, you're, you're so right. She grew up in New Jersey and the natural world was always a topic that was central to her artistic practice. You mentioned in your introduction that Nancy Holt started making concrete poetry. 
she indeed did not begin by training as an artist. Her very first artwork was made in 1966. And before that, um, she did a number of things, including studying biology. And this sense of both biology, the natural world, and New Jersey, where she grew up, remained an enduring concern for her. So we can see it in her earliest work, but right through to some of her later works, including a wonderful artwork called Sky Mound, and we'll see some images of it later, that she made in New Jersey. She started working on it in the mid 1980s, and it remains an unfinished earthwork. So as you say, Nancy Holt was born in 1938 and she was born in Massachusetts. Um, and then she moved as a child to New Jersey and she kept on coming back to these two birthplaces for her. And I've got a, a bunch of notes here and there's a really beautiful quotation about Nancy Holt I wanted to, to share, share with you. So in 1992, Nancy Holt was reflecting on the way that she was working. And she says, this is a quotation from her, looking back, I think growing up in New Jersey was a wonderful experience because it's a limbo place. It was surrounded by the decay of the industrial revolution and had the very first highway culture. So New Jersey is a place that was a wonderful experience for Nancy Holt. And she kept on coming back to it. So Nancy Holt um, was born in Massachusetts, grew up in New Jersey. Then in 1956, she went back to Massachusetts to study biology at Tufts University. And although she was studying biology, this was the moment that she became really interested in art. And she started exploring connections between science and art. And very interestingly, from her third year of studies, she started traveling to New York. And this was the moment that she started seeing art, meeting artists. And she also spent time at MIT, at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, attending lectures about the relationships between art and science. So this first question, Martin, I think really gets to central concerns in her artistic practice. And as soon as she graduated, she moved to New York in 1960. And this is the moment that she made close and enduring friendships with artists such as Joan Jonas, Sol LeWitt, Eva Hesse, Carl Andre, Richard Serra, and Robert Smithson. And the connection with Robert Smithson is a really important one. They um, shared ideas as artists, but they were also life partners. Um, so in 1963, she moved into a studio where she lived and worked, worked with Robert Smithson, and she married Robert Smithson um, on June the 8th in 1963. <laughs> and she looked after his work after Smithson's untimely death in 1973. So this is one of the reasons why the two artistic practices are so closely intertwined. Um, and as Martin and I talk over the next half an hour or so, we're going to show a number of images um, more as a backdrop to our conversations. Um, and if there's any questions or um, ideas that anyone listening would like to discuss, we really welcome talking to the images, but we're really seeing these as more of a backdrop as we share ideas about Nancy Holt's work. And you'll see Robert Smithson coming in again and again, as well as, well as other artists as well. So this feels a good place to start from Nancy Holt's beginnings, an artist who studied biology, an artist for whom New Jersey 
was always important. And an artist who was part of a network of ideas who were rethinking everything that art could possibly be. Exactly. And um, from biology, so to speak, as so many other artists in that time, uh, she was also interested in the basics, let's say the basics where our perception is fixed in. And I think this is probably language. And as you told earlier, um, the, 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 the works, Nancy, first artworks she did in 1966 were actually playing with language. Maybe you could speak a little bit about what did it meant particularly for Nancy in those days? And how did she, did she uh, 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 transform it into her art? I think that language is so important for Nancy Holt. And we can see it in the films that are being shown at Mori Art Museum. And so language is where she began. And something I'm always very interested in thinking about is where do artists begin? So I find it fascinating that between 1963 and 1967, Nancy Holt held a number of part-time jobs, um, as most artists do. Um, so she taught in um, a very experimental school, the Downtown Community School. And she also worked for the magazine Harper's Bazaar. And she was an assistant literary editor at Harper's Bazaar. And her duties included being a copy editor. Now, copy editor, copy editing is a fascinating profession. It's where you look between the words, the sentences, the paragraphs to make sure that the writer says what they want to say and that the reader can stay with the words and also that the language sits on the page as it should. So language is a structure, it's a system. And in 1966, making art became Nancy Holt's reality. And she continued making art until 2014 when she passed away. And exactly as you described, she started off by composing concrete poetry. So what is concrete poetry? Well, concrete poetry is artwork that tests the structure, the content, and the form of language on the page. And I really think, Martin, that Nancy Holt, and you can see her here in this really great image in yeah. the back of a truck, um, Nancy Holt was an artist who was fascinated by how language works as a system. And like any system, language operates as much through its successes as it does through its failures. So one of her earliest artworks that she made in 1966 is called Crossword Work. And we'll see an image of it later as we later, run through the can, yeah. slide presentation. And like the title suggests, Crossword Work is a functional crossword puzzle. It's about fitting language into a grid, into a series of boxes. And it's a puzzle yeah. that works with an exhibition curated by Lucy Lepard. And Nancy Holt used a toolkit of found language. So it could be an exhibition description, it could be place names, it could be fortune cookies. And something else that I think is very interesting, and you, you mentioned in the beginning, Martin, that Nancy Holt used the new media of her own time. So often she would work with photocopies, with typewriters. Um, so really using um, office systems. And often she would substitute a photocopy for the original. 
And I'm really interested by the way that she worked with um, photography. So the images we're seeing now are from a, a body of work she made in 1968 called Western Graveyards. But she also worked with office technology, with photocopies, with photostats that use basic principles of electricity to reproduce. Um, so in terms of concrete poetry, Nancy Holt used words as discrete entities to describe space. And Nancy Holt kept a journal. And it's so interesting to read how she described her own work. And in 1972, she noted that she was fascinated by, and this is a quotation from her, by making words concrete through vision. So in so many ways, the concrete poems announce themes of sight, as in seeing, sight, as in place, as well as geography. And this can be seen throughout Nancy Holt's oeuvre. And again, we can see here these photographs from this series called Western Graveyard. They're concerned with language, yeah. the writing on the stones, with place, the West of the United States, but also with ideas of memory, of systems, and experiment as well. Yeah. Uh, it's very interesting, actually, to what you said before, Lisa, that language is is is, is something a system to to square things, especially if we think about the fact that the circle plays such a big role in Nancy's work later on. But nevertheless, uh, uh, in this time when artists were so busy with with which systems actually organize our worlds in this way or the other like language at the same time there was such a huge desire or to touch primordial beginnings and this is probably the the ruin is is, is a topic as such and we see in the in the background not ruins but we see graves and we see actually uh, uh places which which fade away which we cannot really grab and a topic which in both Nancy's and Robert's and Bob's work was so important was the ruin. And I think in 1967 and 1968, they made a so-called stone ruin tour, which I find uh, so fantastic because it's also questioning what is work or differently said, what kind of work is that? What is the work? Maybe you can tell a little bit about, about this tour in which they wanted to create resonance with the past, which maybe was fading also in this economic boom time when it was all about progress and production. Mm. It's, it's a very, very good question. And I think that um, this work Stone Ruin Tour, which we'll be seeing in just a moment on, on the screen, is such an important work for Nancy Holt. Um, but before I talk about the work, maybe it's interesting to say something about um, the idea of the ruin. What is a, a ruin? A ruin is something that shows a past in the present. And when we were looking at those images of the graveyards, there really is this sense of these markers, these memorials, of someone who has passed that are themselves falling apart. And so it's very much this sense of memory and of place. So Stone Ruin Tour. Well, this is a work that is made from a field of information. Um, so when you see the artwork today, it comprises a score, so a typewritten score, a slideshow, instamatic photographs, and the artist's recorded voice. So this is a multimedia artwork. 
And Nancy Holt described, and I, I really love using Nancy Holt's words because words were important to her, but she described her own work so beautifully. So she described that Stone Ruin Tour is a route through a crumbling labyrinthine garden with stone walls, overlooks, and disappearing stairways in the woods of northern New Jersey. So again, New Jersey is important. So this artwork brings language from the page into the landscape. And it marks Nancy Holt's first experiments with both sound and photography. So what is the work? Well, in June, 1966, Nancy Holt recorded herself dictating a tour through a ruin in Cedar Grove, New Jersey. So almost like an audio tour that we might have if we were visiting a tourist site. She then transcribed this tour and she shared this transcription with artist friends, specifically Joan Jonas, who's the person who we saw walking up a hill and down a hill earlier, and Robert Smithson. And she left it as an unfinished guide. So the artwork is all about exploration of sight, of the ways in which language and perhaps all maps are somehow imperfect. So how do we find our place in the world? Well, we do so through guides. Um, and I'd also just like to mention slightly laterally that the images we're seeing here are of Nancy Holt's artwork, Sun Tunnels, probably yeah. her best known work. And what we can see here is the construction of the work. Um, Sun Tunnels was made between 1973 and 1976. And we're talking about a ruin while we're seeing a construction. And ruins are formed out of constructions. So Nancy Holt is always thinking about building, unbuilding, site. Um, and um, this sense of how we explore place is very important. And if I can, Martin, I'd like to just mention something import important that Nancy Holt did in 1969. She traveled um, to England and Wales with Robert yeah. Smithson. Yeah. And it feels uh, the right thing to mention because I'm actually sitting talking to you in England right now. And this was a trip where both artists made a number of artworks responding to the landscape. And there are three very wonderful works that Nancy Holt made there. There's one I'd like to mention um, that's also a ruin. She went to a location called Wisman's Wood in Dartmoor, and there she created the first of her buried poems. And she dedicated this buried poem, which is literally a poem buried in the earth. She dedicated this first buried poem to Robert Smithson. Um, and in 2012, Nancy Holt described the buried poems. And I'd like to just read again her own description of this, because I think it speaks to your question and to the images that we're seeing on the screen. She said, a sight evokes a person, and I buried a poem for that person, and later gave the person a booklet, including maps, detailed directions, and a list of equipment, such as a compass and a shovel, in order to find it. 
to me, Wisman's Wood conjured up Bob's persona in a striking way. So she's interested in a sight conjuring up a persona in a certain way. So yeah. sights are about memory and people too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's it's extremely beautiful this idea to think a sight as a person. And uh, I mean, Robert Smithson and Nancy Holt made many works together, such as also Swamp, which is shown in the Mori Art Museum. And uh, I think in this work, actually, the, the, the witty and unapologetic lightness of how these two artists dealt with their relation becomes really available. And also that relation can be something very positive. And so is there some common thread you would see in the few works they collaboratively did, Nancy mm. and Bob? Well, certainly Holt and Smithson had a productive exchange ideas. And it's very clear that they were, we could say, intellectual sparring partners. They traveled together and they thought together. And we can see in these images of them traveling together to, to New Jersey. And they mutually supported each other. And in fact, the gallerist Virginia Dwan recalled that in the early 1970s, Smithson said many times, it is Nancy's time now. So they were really supporting each other. Um, And just as a note, the images that we're seeing on the screen now is the slideshow component of the artwork Stone Ruin Tour. Oh, yeah. Um, but I have to say that Swamp is one of my favorite works by Holt and Smithson. And I'm so pleased that you've selected to show it at Mori Art Museum. Swamp is shot in the Swamplands of New Jersey. And we talked about New Jersey earlier, both Robert Smithson, who we can see here looking quite moody, both uh, Robert Smithson and Nancy Holt grew up in New Jersey. And they kept on coming back to the New Jersey swamps and to the Pine Barrens. So Swamp is a 16 millimeter film And it explores the mechanics of seeing through sight. So this is a core concern for Nancy Holt. And here she is on, on screen again. Um, so in this film, it looks through the viewfinder of her Bolex camera, focusing a really tight close up. And Nancy Holt attempts to walk through the landscape, but she's looking through the camera and she's focused too close for steady process. So in the film, the view through the camera is overwhelmed by detail. All you can see is the swamp and a visceral, really chaotic journey unfolds and both artists confront dense plant life. So that recalls the comment about biology that you made earlier, Martin. And through the dense maze of plant life, they struggle with the limitations of their own perception. And also for the failure of technology to stand in for vision. And the visual element in this film is exactly what Nancy Holt sees. Um, it's a mass of vegetation. Now the audio, on the other hand, it reveals the sounds of the couple moving through the reeds. And you can hear the wind blowing, the camera clicking, and Robert Smithson giving verbal directions as he tries to see for Holt. And throughout Robert Smithson's writings and artworks, Smithson critiqued vision for being objective 
knowledge. He was always pointing to blind spots and distortions. And there's a great moment in the film that I'd like to read for you. So Robert Smithson says, just walk in a straight line, straight into that clump. It's okay, Nan, you're on fairly solid ground. Straight in, just go right in. Go straight in over that way. Turn to your right, your right, in, into that clump there, directly in. It's okay, go ahead. <laughs> and when you go to see the film, you understand that Nancy Holt's vision is partial and distorted. And she responds, I think, wonderfully to Robert Smithson's advice by saying, so much of this is out of focus. Focus, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it, I mean, it's in the end also the swamp which a relation can be, uh, where this work is indirectly also about. I mean, it's all about context, which came more and more in the center in these times. And I, I liked it when you said... Uh, uh, or, or, or Robert Smithson, obviously, 1971 said uh, uh, Nancy's time is about to come. And I think that that the so-called locator series, in a way, opened that time in another way, because it also led to sun tunnels. Maybe you could briefly speak a little bit from the way to these locators, how they actually worked. And then also on sun tunnels, which is uh, uh, where we show the video in the Mori Art Museum. Yes, the locators were Nancy Holt's first sculptures. She started making them in 1971. And interestingly, they came out of her interest in photography. So we talked about Stone Ruin Tour before. This is the moment when she started working with photography. Hmm. And you also mentioned, Martin, the circle. We can see the circle on the screen now. And it was photography's serial, circular, and seeing nature that led to her sculptural thinking. So in 1971, Nancy Holt created her locators. These are sculptural seeing devices that draw attention to visual perception and place. They are very simple constructions made of two industrial pipes positioned at eye level, resembling a telescope or the viewfinder of a camera. So she made her locators they, they really are such simple works. First in her studio in New York that she shared with Robert Smithson. And she focused them on views from her studio windows. So she looked out of the windows um, and she then started to think about how she could move them from the studio to site them in exhibition spaces. So there's one really wonderful work called Locators with Loci, where you look through five of these locators, imagine closing one eye and looking through this telescope. And when you look through, there's a black circle edged with a light ring. And it's a really similar experience to looking up at the moon on a clear, dark night. Then there's another locator that when you look through them, you see a mirror. It's titled Locator with Mirror. And one sees one's own eye looking back. So Nancy Holt's locators continued to develop. She was an artist always developing ideas and she moved them out of the confines of the built environment in 1972, initially with an artwork called Missoula Ranch Locators. And in fact, here is a poster of Missoula 
branch locators. And exactly as you say, the locators did indeed directly lead to the landmark earthwork, sun tunnels, which is located in the Great Basin Desert. And this here is Missoula Ranch Locators. And as we talk and as those listening to Martin and I see these images, I think you'll start to get a sense of how important the locators were and that they really developed to this incredible earthwork we call yeah. sun tunnels. Yeah. Absolutely. Here we see a view through a sand dune, which is one of my uh, most favorite uh, locator related work. But um, uh, in regard to sun tunnels, some few questions. Um, I think it's a work which which plays with the idea of sight because it also relativizes sight because we think often about sight specificity, but our our site on earth is also a relative site because we are just a part of the universe so in how far does this uh, does this thought translate in nancy's work which we could rather describe as site resonant and not as site specific to make this difference i think you're very right martin that nancy holt made works that was sight resonant because she was so sensitive to the specifics of the environment. Um, the work we're seeing here was made in 1972, um, but I'd like to talk a little more about um, sun tunnels and about Please. process, because yeah. financial process was so important and she was extremely mindful of the people who she worked with so um she valued the expertise of tradespeople to the highest level so sun tunnels she mm -hmm. came up with the idea for sun tunnels in 1973 and she spent a long time trying to find the right site. She first looked to New Mexico, which is where Holtzmithson Foundation is located. But she found that there were too many overhead electricity wires to really get this sense of the landscape. And then she also looked to Arizona, um, and she has this wonderful phrase. She said that the cactus were too charismatic. So in Arizona, you have cactuses that look like this. Um, and she felt that they interrupted the landscape. And then she found the Great Basin Desert in Utah. And this is a place where the landscape stretches for miles and you can see very little human interruption. Now, in 1970, before she started working on sun tunnels, she had already visited the Great Basin Desert. And this is a site that's characterized by its repeating basin and range topography. And while she was there, she made a silent film called Utah Sequences that was filmed on the northern shore of the Great Salt Lake. And this film shows Nancy Holt's deep investigation into how landscape is first shaped by geological history and secondly, by human intervention. And it's a film that invites conversations about entropy, about time scales, and the human impact on the environment. Now, I think very importantly, unlike her male land art counterparts, yeah. <laughs> Nancy Holt was so responsive 
to sight. And in fact, she purchased herself the land on which Sun Tunnels sits. And she also managed an enormous team. So the film Sun Tunnels that we will see at the museum was made in 1978, two years after she completed the earthwork, Sun Tunnels. And we see in the film the process of making Sun Tunnels. And I often think that Sun Tunnels is so much more than just a landscape, it's ju just a sculpture in landscape. Um, it comprises drawings, it comprises photo studies, a film and writings. So Sun Tunnels exists in the orbiting conversations, alluding to remoteness and travel and in images taken by many people at many times. So what is Sun Tunnels? Well, Sun Tunnels is an earthwork comprising four concrete cylinders and they measure 18 feet in length and nine feet in diameter. Nancy Holt preferred using feet to, to meters um, <laughs> and they're set in an X formation in the Great Basin Desert in Utah. And each tunnel is perforated with patterns of stellar constellations. So holes that bring the stars down to earth. While the daily seasonal movement of the sun and the moon they're always casting light through these holes and there's ever changing shadows. And shadows were important to Nancy Holt. We can see them in the images we're seeing now of a sculpture called Annual Ring that she made. Sun Tunnels, importantly, is aligned perfectly with the sun's rise and fall on the summer and winter solstices. And scale was so important to Nancy Holt. Yeah. So each tunnel is large enough for an average person to stand inside. And these holes are just big enough to push a hand through. So its sight and scale are so important to Nancy Holt. Yeah, yeah. and uh also to work with light and um but you said that she went in the desert maybe you you have this beautiful list of people who collaborated on that maybe you can read it later on but one, one other side of this whole movement of course is that this land was first nation land so my question is, how do you, uh, as a foundation, deal with that, with, with that simple fact? Because I think it's also a fact which gets more and more acknowledged uh, over the last years. Yes, this is such an important point to bring up. The truth is that in the United States, we are all living on stolen land. Sun Tunnel sits on the ancestral lands of the Western Shoshone and Gushut peoples. And to understand Sun Tunnels, we need to recognize, acknowledge, and underline the complexities, the genocides, the conflicts of land that forms the United States. I would actually say that um, the land in the United States is always, First Nation land. And how do we at the foundation acknowledge this? By describing the lands just as I have um, and acknowledging the long history of the United States that is pre the United States existing. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I th also think that, that the way Nancy Holt worked, which was actually not this heroic way some of her male counterparts approached uh, the land with 
uh, which also reads uh, uh, really beautifully in the in this list of so many collaborators from the building industry and Mori Art Museum is also connected with the building industry. So um, we are always very keen on, on, on learning more about that. But uh, now that we have these images in the background, I'd like to ask you a, a, about another, uh, let's say, body of work which slowly grew out in this oeuvre, which is a little bit like trees with rings, with mm -hmm. rings in a tree, one is building on another. And Nancy Holt actually in the 80s already started to work with existing infrastructures, which is or adapt her work to existing infrastructures, something which is for contemporary artists today so important. And I, I know so many practitioners who do that, who actually uh, not work with the symbolic space anymore, but the real space of a building, or how to interfere there. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about those fascinating uh, works Nancy did in the 80s. I mean, I really agree. The system works that Nancy Holt made are so contemporary. We're looking at a work now called Hot Water Heat. Um, and her systems works and very similar to her formative text and light investigations. What they do is deploy found systems. So we're returning to systems again yeah, yeah. to reveal what is there already. And they use standard industrial materials that are designed for introducing heating, ventilation, lighting, and drainage into the built environment. So we saw just a few moments ago, um, works that were looking at drainage systems. So Nancy Holt was interested in showing us these systems. Um, so for example, switching on a light in a room, I have my lights on here because it's quite dark where I, I'm sitting. If I switch a light on in a room, it opens an immediate connection to power grids and to the natural resources that we exploit for our own use. So the system works, expose the flows of energy that power buildings. Right now, the work Electrical System, which Nancy Holt made in 1982, is on show at Sprout Margus, Los Angeles. And this is such a wonderful installation. It's a network of glowing light bulbs. And we saw earlier some historic installations of it. And the light bulbs are connected to a structure of wonderfully arching conduit that expands out of the gallery's power system, exposing, as Nancy Holt described, fragments of vast hidden systems. And Nancy Holt said that these artworks reveal these systems as being, and I quote here, part of open-ended systems, part of the world. And also in Europe right now, representing another system work, ventilation system at Bilt Musette in Sweden. And this is an artwork that shows the museum building breathing air inside and outside. So Nancy Holt wanted to make us more aware of what exists around us, to encourage us to look harder, to listen harder, maybe to perceive harder and by doing this to think deeper about our place in the world yeah 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 in in, in the work we often uh see moments of looking through uh perceptive moments but something we didn't really talk about by now or only in a subtext which i'd like to ask you also is that of course in the 60s and 70s as a female artist it was also about looked at 
So, and for me, the way Nancy Holt was dealing with that issue to be a, a women artist in that time was a very elegant and unapologetic one, I think. But how how do you see that? How how did she maneuver uh, 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 with, with that fact throughout the years? It's a, a good question. Nancy Holt, um, as you said, right at the beginning of our conversation, she's not as well known as Robert Smithson, not just in, in Japan, I would say across all of the, the world. Um, female artists were not heard as much as male artists in the 1960s. And perhaps we're still in that situation even now in 2022. Um, Nancy Holt persisted she made works and you can see from I think we're showing maybe 400 slides today you can see that she made so much work I think Nancy Holt was very interested in relationships between the inside and the outside because she as a female artist was on the outside always and she continues to be on the outside i think we can see it in the artworks such as the locators that we just discussed but for her inside and outside is very important metaphorically as much as it is literally yeah so perception was important to her. Um, what is perception? Perceiving is not just about what is outside of us. It's also what we feel inside. So our surrounding world changes as, as we change. So we're talking right now around 10.30 in the morning for me. So I'm sitting in London and behind my screen, I can see through windows, looking out on the November London weather, I'm sitting on the sixth floor of a tower block. And if I'm truthful, I'm a little hungry right now. Um, so if I did not tell you, you would not know these facts, but now you do know you're probably understanding how my specific perception at this moment has a context. So Nancy Holt knew that her work was to be looked at, yet she creates artworks that are about looking with. Yeah. About a very particular understanding that perception is both personal and universal. And there's one concrete poem that she made called Making Waves. And this is a really important work and perhaps it's the only artwork that reveals her feminist sensibility. And I will briefly describe this concrete poem to you. It's a graph. And it's a graph that charts how Nancy Holt feels over a 24 hour period. And she draws three lines, one line for when she feels her identity is an artist. Another line for when she feels her identity is a mystic. And another line when she feels her identity is a feminist. And the lines move. Sometimes they come together. Other times they leave each other. They diverge. So it's a long answer to your question because your question is so important. 
Yeah, yeah, and it also it blends in wonderfully to what Nancy herself once said, which is she said, I had no product and I was a woman, so I was in a sense non-existent. And I think this idea of having a product leads also directly to my four last question, because I think with the way Nancy worked, she also redefined some ideas about work or what work can be. Uh, um, and uh, if we look on, on her oeuvre over the years, it seems as if she didn't make more and more products, but rather that she focused more on more to be as precise as possible and work with the existing vocabulary she, she developed over the years. So, so maybe you could, and apart from that, she was managing the estate of Robert Smithson, which she, we shouldn't forget as well. So maybe you could tell me some last things about what, what, what was work for her? Ha. Huh. I think work for her was all about communicating that art really matters. And I think Nancy Holt shows us that art matters because it can reveal to us how we humans try and often fail to find our place on the surface of our planet. And for me, that is what is so wonderful about Nancy Holt's work. And also so simple. <laughs> and so simple, yes. It's a beautiful, simple finding. So, and maybe as my last question, um, before potential questions from our audience come in, um, so you were just doing this, you were just publishing and working on this book. And um, what, what, was, what, what was for you the main finding actually in your research? Because I can imagine that you were also discovering or rediscovering Nancy for yourself. I think that, um, so this is a book that's titled Inside Outside. And in developing the research for this book, I think what I discovered is that um, I probably love Nancy Holt's work even more than I thought that I did, um, which is a wonderful situation. And I think I learned the consistency of her artwork. So this echoes what you just said, Martin, that she was investigating, researching how we perceive. And perhaps something that is a good way to move us to see if anyone has any questions is to talk about um, how Nancy Holt wanted to define herself. She called herself a perception artist. So she did not want to be called a land artist. Yeah. She did not want to be called a conceptual artist. She did not even want to be called a sculptor. She wanted to be called a perception artist. And I think what we learned through researching this book is that perception artist is the perfect description for Nancy Holt. Yeah, yeah, because it exactly marks the border between inside and outside, between subject and object, uh, uh, and it goes beyond any media category. Um, and it also includes Nancy's awareness that we live in an expansive universe where maybe the constellations will change in the future, which I find quite beautiful as well. As far as I see here, there are no questions at this very moment yet. So I would uh, like... If, if there are no questions, then I would like to ask you a question. Martin. Please go ahead. Um, I would like to ask you, um, 
why you think Nancy Holt's work is the right work to present at the Mori Art Museum? Because I think to summarize the content from our now one hour long collaboration, because she is an artist who makes us in a such a delicate, subtle, conceptually strong manner aware of the contexts we live in, that every white cube is just a part of a larger entity. And all these entities are based on decisions. And art is actually capable to, to go beyond the walls and can embrace context and just create awareness. And she's doing that not with artistic products in a classical sense, but she's doing that in establishing processes. And from there, I think, thinking processes can start. And I think, especially uh, as many other museums in the world, uh, Mori is of course part of a larger structure. And I think artists who make us aware of the structure we are sur surrounded by, which determine, de determine the ways we act and live, are really the perfect ones for this particular moment in time where we should not ask ourselves, what do we need, but rather, what do we have? Because I think uh, uh, the work of Nancy also responds perfectly to the climate situation we live in and to so many other really urgent issues of the contemporary time. And so that's why I'm super happy to be able to uh, uh, with the team that we can present those films, but the films are also just an opportunity for us to go deeper in the in the, in the work. And so it's fantastic that you could show us a little bit that, and that's also a part of Nancy's thinking that sun tunnels, which could be considered as an icon, that every icon has a context, like every tree has many rings. And so this is what we could learn today and and. Uh, yeah, due to these uh, words, I think we really can learn a lot from Nancy Holt for the present. Mm. Thank you, Martin. What, what a beautiful response. I, I'm going to take notes. Um, perfect. Thank you for sharing <laughs> that. Yeah. Okay. Um, oh, great. There's one question now coming in. And I think it's a question to, uh, uh, to you, Lisa, and I think it's and the question is, please, can you say uh, more about Nancy Holt as a mystic, which popped up in the in the particular work you were? And thank you for the wonderful talk. The person also says, but what, uh, Lisa, uh, this idea of the mystic in Nancy it's, Holt? It's a really great question, and it's a it's a it's a difficult question. So. In this artwork, Making Waves, Nancy Holt described herself as being an artist. So we know what an artist is. A feminist, we know what a feminist is. And a mystic. So what is a mystic? Well, a mystic is someone who somehow thinks outside of systems. Um, so mysticism is often seen as being something that doesn't deal necessarily with rational thought, but values the power of irrational thought. And I've asked myself a lot what mystic might mean to Nancy Holt. And I'd like to answer this question. I'm not saying this is the right answer. This is my interpretation. When we were talking earlier, we were talking about um, concrete poetry. And concrete poetry is about not just looking at language, but looking between the words, looking between the sentences. I think for Nancy Holt, that's what mysticism is. It's looking between, looking at almost this um, uh, magical vibration between our assumptions. 
And I like it very much that she's talking about being a feminist, an artist, and a mystic. Three different coordinates. And I think this really takes us back to the way that Nancy Holt um, is always asking us to pay attention. And when you watch the three films that we um, are showing at Maury Art Museum, the two works by Nancy Holt, Sun Tunnels and Swamp, both of them are kind of mystic. They're asking us to look beyond to look between and maybe to suspend our assumptions. And perhaps, you can tell that I really like this question, perhaps this is what all art does. It gets us to think beyond the limits of the range, to think beyond known horizons. And with that, we can shift the way that we perceive the world. And if we change our perceptions, we really can change the world in some way. So mysticism, it's this um, ineffable, um, difficult to grasp power that exceeds language. So that's my reading. I'm not saying this is the only reading, but it's one way of thinking about Nancy Holt's use of this term mystic. Yeah, but it's a, it's a very beautiful answer because it also shows the lightness of how Nancy was able to go beyond modernism uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, in her practice, right? which is, of course, see, deeply rooted in there. But as so many artists, she also wanted to, to, to reach something else, a periphery of our uh, uh, experience horizon, so to speak. And, and she did that in a very specific, light manner, I think. I think there are no more questions right now. Do you have any more questions? I don't think so. <laughs> I you see I always have a million questions and I could talk about Nancy Holt for the next three hours or so <laughs> but perhaps what we can say if anyone listening to us does have questions do be in touch with the museum or with us at Holt Smithson Foundation and perhaps something um to close our, our talk, um, Holt Smithson Foundation, as Martin said at the beginning, is dedicated to the legacies of Nancy Holt and Robert Smithson. But the only way that we can look about, look after those legacies is by finding out new knowledge. And how do we find out new knowledge? By asking questions. And in many ways, this is the method of Nancy Holt and Robert Smithson. I don't think these are artists who give us um, answers. They give us proposals for thought and questions. I think that was also, in fact, a wonderful answer to another question which came in, because it was actually the question was uh, how and in which way you think the foundation should ideally continue Holt and Smithson's practice. But I think you, you just gave the answer by embracing questions. And I think mm -hmm. this, is, this, is, this is a great, great answer. And mm -hmm. I think with that, I would also like to... Um, Thank you very much, uh, uh, Lisa, for, for, for talking to us and, and ma making us learning with Nancy Holt for the present. So this is very wonderful. And I want to thank you and your team for the, for the generous support of, of the whole project in Mori Art Museum. And uh, I also hope that as much as people come to see the exhibition, the screening and uh, in early March, we will have a colleague from Japan speaking about Robert Smithson. Mm -hmm. 
and also trying to rediscover Robert Smithson's meaning for the present, which is also we you, we could talk endlessly about that. And so we hope you you will also be able to see that. Yeah. So, so thank you, thank sure. you very very much. And the, uh, the thank the thanks are all mine, and we really hope at Holt Smithson Foundation that this is the start of a conversation. There's so much to talk about, and it's been such a pleasure on this Thursday morning, my time to, to join you. So we continue. Thank you very much and have a further nice gray London day. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.